Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Murray. I'm one of the dietitians with the Villages Health. Um, and today we will, be, we will be talking about nutrition for a healthy gut. So talking about all those little critters that live in your gut. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be talking about why gut health is important, what's so significant about your gut health. We're going to be talking about the composition of your intestinal flora. Intestinal flora is just another name for that gut bacteria that's living in your gut. We're, we're going to go over that more in just a little bit as well. But um, essentially, there's bacteria that lives in our gut, helps to keep us he healthy. Um, we're going to be going over the composition of that and what that actually looks like. We're going to be talking about the impact of beneficial versus harmful gut bacteria. We're going to be talking about what your likely gut mi mi microbiome might look like. Um, and we're going to talk about how certain bacteria tends to respond to specific diets. So we're going to be talking about the impact of your specific diet on your gut health and then how to establish a healthy gut microbiome through nutrition, of course. So there are about 100 trillion organisms, microorganisms in the human gut. So this is a, a significant amount, obviously, and cellularly, if you look at the human body, we're only about 10% human and 90% bacteria. Genetically, we're about 1% human and 99% bacteria. So you can imagine the big role that gut bacteria actually plays in our overall health. So that's why it's so important to consider it. Um, so beneficial bacteria, it's been seen to play a major role in a bunch of um, bodily functions, including immunity, digestion, and protection against chronic diseases, um, whereas harmful bacteria can have the opposite effect. It can have a detrimental effect on us, and it can actually exacerbate a whole group of different disease states, um, it can exacerbate obesity, psoriasis, autism, different mood disorders, just to name a few. So um, your gut bacteria, it, it does vary among individuals, but a, an individual's gut bacteria tends to stay relatively stable unless there's something else that comes about. So if you become really sick, uh, if you are on a round of antibiotics, especially for an extended period of time, or if you have significant dietary changes, then we can expect that your gut bacteria will change. But um, for most people, the, the gut bacteria tends to stay pretty stable. So there are three main functions of the gut bacteria. Um, the first one here is metabolic effects. Basically, our gut bacteria facilitates in fermentation of non-digestible dietary matter um, and helps us to break down our gut muc mucus, which is really important. We want that turnover, and we want the, the metabolism of those non-digestible foods. It makes our vitamins more easily absorbable to us, different nutrients like calcium, magnesium, iron. Um, it, it makes all of those more absorbable to us. So we want that gut bacteria there because it breaks down that food a little bit more for us and makes it easier for us to um, get those healthy nutrients. Um, they also secrete different hormones, um, so they're, they're helpful in the production of different vitamins like vitamin K and vitamin B. So our gut bacteria actually helps us to get those vitamins as well as different minerals. Um, the GI cell turnover, so that's a trophic effect. It really helps with the proliferation and differentiation of different cells that are lining the GI tract. So we're basically... Um, turning over the cells of the GI tract, of that, that tube that is our GI tract. Um, we're turning over those cells, those cells and it promotes um, in the development of functional intestines. So if you have any kind of gut issues, it can help us to have um, new cells there, which we're going to work better, hopefully. Um, it, they, our gut also, our gut microbiome also helps with protective immune effects, and this one's really important. Um, many people don't realize that a huge portion of our immune system is in our guts. So if you think about the guts as as a tube, and it's basically separating the outside world from the inside of your body. So this is our first line of defense when it comes to our immune system. We want to have a strong gut barrier in that way. 
So this slide um, is basically for a wow factor. You don't really need to memorize any of these. There is no real benefit that comes here, but I'm going to go through some of these that might be um, helpful to be aware of. So on the beneficial bacteria side of this list, you can see bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. Those are the two top ones. Those are the two primary ones that you'll find um, out in the world when you're looking at different probiotics or um, like yogurt, for instance, anything that's cultured, um, you're typically going to see those two in the cultures. Um, those are the two that has, have the most amount of research behind them, and we do know that they're beneficial, so um, they're the ones that are most primarily in our, um, in our world, in our market. Um, but of course, not all bacteria provides benefits, so we have those harmful bacteria over there on the right. Um, these, these are the ones that we want to avoid having an abundance of them in our gut. Um, having a little bit in our gut is not going to be the end of the world, but we don't want an overabundance. We don't want them to take over our GI tract. Some of them you might recognize there. Um, you can see E. coli right here, um, the, the sixth one down. Uh, the one right below that is H. pylori. You might recognize that. Right below that you have strepto streptococcus, which is strep. Uh, below that you have salmonella. We all know that one. The next one we have staph, staph staphylococcus. So um, you might recognize some of those harmful ones. We don't want those to be too much in abundance in our gut. And in this slide here, you can see how some of those beneficial ones can actually have some positive associated disease states. So um, decreasing obesity, decreasing inflammatory bowel diseases, decreasing obesity and inflammatory bowel diseases, decreasing obesity and, and different inflammatory diseases, and increasing insulin sensitivity, which is beneficial for blood sugar control. But it's not all about the diet. There are some other factors that we do want to consider here as well. So um, your diet obviously plays a huge factor. Your genetics can play a role as well, um, especially if you know they, it, it derives from your lifestyle. So if your um, family raised you to eat in certain ways and you're still eating that certain way, um, that's obviously going to play a role in how you, you eat and your gut bacteria in turn as well. Um, but research has shown that genetics is about 30% of our, our current disease states, so taking that into account as well. Your stress levels are going to play a big role on inflammation in your gut health, so um, trying to keep stress levels to a minimum. Physical activity, which can also help with the stress, uh, making sure you're getting physically active, turning those cells over in that way is really important. Um, the recommendation for physical activity is at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity every single week. So that's getting your heart rate up for 150 minutes every week. Um, and then we also want to get at least two days of some kind of strength or resistance exercise as well. So trying to get that physical activity in. Sleep is another big one as well, so the recommendation is about seven to nine hours of sleep a night. So um, are you checking all those boxes? What are you doing? Where can you improve? Um, just focusing on where you might have some room for improvement there. I'm also going to throw in there, um, we also want to make sure we're staying hydrated as well. So recommendation for water is at least 64 ounces of water a day. Um, so, you know, depending on your activity level, if you're sweating at all, you want to increase your fluid from there, but a baseline of 64 ounces is a standard recommendation. So um, just kind of checking in with yourself and, and where you might be um, in terms of factors other than diet. And this is an interesting study that I found here, um, but they, they found that um, simply moving to the U.S. has seen a link to increased obesity and also changes in the gut microbiome, specifically decreases in diversity of the gut microbiome. And this can occur within months of using to, moving to the U.S. So um, they've actually found that about half of the diversity of gut bacteria has um, of, um, I'm sorry, half the diversity of gut microbiomes, of gut microbiome in the U.S. individual um, has been seen over the, since the 1940s. So in the 1940s, we had twice as much diversity in our gut microbiome than we do now. So that's a pretty huge, significant amount. We, we love that diversity. We want to have a diverse gut. We don't want just um, those primary 
ones that you can get off the shelf. We want a diversity of those beneficial gut bacteria. So since the 1940s, we've seen a big decrease in there, and um, they're assuming that that's happened because of the increase in processed foods and antibiotic uses have become more prevalent, um, but they're saying that dietary factors were only a partial contributor. So something else is going on there. It might be lifestyle, um, not exactly sure, but interesting fact there. So some signs that your gut might be out of balance. This is also known as dysbiosis. Um, so just something to keep in mind there. If you're currently on antibiotics, your gut may be out of balance. Or if you recently stopped taking antibiotics, um, if you're not a veggie eater, so say you, you only like meat and potatoes, your gut is probably out of balance. If you're stressed out all the time, if you don't get enough sleep like we were saying earlier, or if you have a chronic inflammatory disease or autoimmune condition, your gut may very well be out of balance. So something to keep in mind there, um, if your gut is out, out of balance, we might need to take some extra effort to try to get it back into balance. Um, and, and just a note here, those inflammatory diseases, oftentimes they have to do with um, your gut inflammatory diseases, like uh, Crohn's or colitis. Those are just some things to keep in mind there. Um, definitely impact your gut health. So um, coming up next year, I'm going to go into specific uh, dietary factors and how they can impact your gut. So we're going to delve right into things. So um, here we're focusing on protein impact on your gut microbiome. So um, in this study, they compared plant proteins versus animal proteins. Um, and they found that the plant protein uh, ha has found to increase more of the beneficial gut bacteria and decrease some of the harmful gut bacteria, whereas animal protein, like your, your meats, your chickens, um, your your even fish, really, um, has been seen to increase more harmful gut bacteria and decrease some of the beneficial gut bacteria. So decreasing animal proteins, increasing the plant proteins would be more appropriate, not eating too much animal proteins and focusing on those plant sources. So in this way, um, the plant proteins were seen to increase our short-chain fatty acids, which can help to increase our um, our immune system um, in the gut, increase that gut barrier and decrease inflammation. Animal proteins were seen to increase inflammatory uh, markers, and that has been linked to increased cardiovascular disease and decrease that um, immune system response that and, and exacerbate any kind of inflammatory bowel diseases that might be there. So next we're looking at fat. So we're comparing a saturated fat diet, a low saturated fat diet versus a high fat diet. Um, just to give you some comparisons here, a low saturated fat diet, where are saturated fats really coming from? A lot of them are coming from those animal proteins. So um, this is kind of related to those protein sources. So a lot of our saturated fats are coming specifically from our dairy products. So think your, your milk, your cheeses, they're quite high in saturated fats, your fatty cuts of beef or, or pork. Um, these have, um, so a low saturated fat has been linked to a promotion of beneficial gut bacteria. So avoiding too much of those high saturated fats, fat foods that I just listed. And this has actually been associated with reduced fasting glucose and reduced total cholesterol, all beneficial things. A high fat diet in general, uh, I don't know if you can think of any diets that might be popular right now that are high in fat, but first one that comes to my mind is a keto diet. A keto diet is a high fat diet, um, and this has been linked to a promotion of harmful gut bacteria and increased inflammation. So maybe not the best route to go about if you're looking for gut health. Delving more into fats here, we're comparing saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Um, your saturated fats can come from some plant sources as well, uh, namely if you're doing any kind of um, uh, uh, coconut oil or palm oil, those are high saturated fat foods, oils, um, and then additionally butter, of course, is going to be higher in saturated fat because it is an animal fat, bacon, things like that. Unsaturated fats are going to be coming more from your olive oil, avocado, nuts and seeds. They're going to be higher in unsaturated fats. So unsaturated fat has been linked to increases in um, beneficial gut bacteria, 
and have been um, seen to inhibit inflammation uh, and decrease total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol, I like to think of the L as standing for lousy. That's the bad cholesterol. We want to keep that one down, and it has been seen to decrease that LDL cholesterol. The saturated fat, on the other hand, was linked to increases in the harmful gut bacteria and um, inhibition of insulin sensitivity. That's supposed to be a pancreas over there on the side. You can't really tell, but that is a pancreas. So it's been linked to inhibition of insulin sensitivity, which is going to lead to higher blood sugars um, and a promotion of inflammation throughout the, the body. So going into our carbohydrate sources, um, here we're looking at a high intake of natural sugars. Um, so these are going to be largely coming from like our, our fruits, um, our even um, like our uh, like our honey or some other kind of natural sugar sources like our um, maple syrup, pure maple, maple syrup. So a high intake of our natural sugars has been linked to a promotion of beneficial gut bacteria. So maybe focusing more on the, the fruit sources has been linked to decreased inflammation. Um, and then comparing that to an intake of simple sugars, those simple sugars are going to be our more processed sugars, like, um, like cane sugar, for example. Um, it's been linked to a promotion of harmful gut bacteria. And they didn't recognize an exact disease state associated with this, but you can assume what harmful gut bacteria it's going to lead to. Next here, so if you're saying, okay, well, I can't eat regular sugar, maybe I should just go for some Splenda or Sweet and Low or Equal. Um, those are artificial sweeteners, and they've actually been linked to a promotion of harmful gut bacteria and actually a, a disease state of promotion of in glucose intolerance. So, um, you know, a lot of people with trying to control their blood sugar are going to reach for those artificial sweeteners. Um, that's going to be linked to promotion of glucose intolerance, which is um, going to increase your blood sugar. So it's kind of ironic in that way, uh, going for more, more natural sweeteners. Um, so even things that are natural and sugar-free are going to be like your stevia or your monk fruit extract. Um, so, so maybe reaching for those instead when you can. Um, but I always urge people to make sure they look at the ingredients list when they're buying those as well, because oftentimes if you're getting a powdered version especially, they have to cut that, um, that monk fruit or that stevia with something to get it into a powdered form. So look at the ingredients list and see what they're using. Oftentimes it's going to be some kind of artificial sweetener or even just sugar in general. So um, do look at that ingredients list. And then our fiber intake as well. Fiber has been linked to a whole bunch of different disease states here. You can see that um, a promotion of beneficial gut bacteria, though, reduced insulin resistance, reduced body weight, reduced triglycerides, reduced total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, reduced A1C, that's related to your blood sugar, and reduced inflammation, all, all such wonderful things. So that's all coming from our, our fiber. Um, and that's because those, um, those carbohydrates are not digestible by us, but they are digestible by our bacteria living in our gut. So the more fiber you're eating, the more you're feeding that beneficial gut bacteria. So more fiber, more better. And then as a, just a cherry on top here, I also added in polyphenol impact on our gut bacteria. Um, polyphenol is those, um, those um, Sorry, there are those antioxidants. So think your catechins, your flavonoids, your flavones, and anthocyanins. These are all anti-inflammatories, and they're largely going to be coming from our berries, um, our mushrooms, our different vegetables. Um, they're, they're all wonderful sources of polyphenols, and they've been linked to a promotion of gut bacteria. So make sure you throw some berries on top of there. And then this next slide here, so people always ask about probiotic versus prebiotic. What's the difference? So probiotic, you can see this little diagram here on the bottom. You can think of your probiotics as your gut bacteria. So you, they're the, the Pac-Men here in the situation. Your prebiotics are the food for the gut bacteria. So you can think about those non-digestible carbohydrates, those, those uh, fiber-rich sources. They're going to be your prebiotics, the food for your bacteria, the probiotics. 
So foods that are rich in probiotics, they're going to be foods that contain that beneficial bacteria. That's why they are a probiotic. Like yogurt, for instance, just in order to be called yogurt per the FDA, they have to have 100 million life cultures per gram. So all of your yogurt is going to contain that. So if there's yogurt on the label, that's what that means. That means that there's plenty of cultures, there's plenty of gut bacteria, there's plenty of bacteria that you can put in your gut by eating that yogurt. So yogurt is a probiotic rich food. Sauerkraut, that's a fermented food. Any kind of fermented foods are going to be probiotic rich. So sauerkraut, kefir, um, and, and if you know what that is, that's a, um, that's a drinkable yogurt, like dairy, um, beverage. It is fermented though. Kimchi, that's a Korean um, cabbage fermented, like spicy. Kombucha is a fermented tea. Pickles, we should all know what pickles are. Um, tempeh, tempeh is a pressed soybean, uh, uh, like pressed soybeans, and they make it into like a brick. Um, it's, it's pretty like an umami kind of flavor, savory. You can really put it on anything though. You can um, use it in place of meat. Um, miso, that's a soybean paste, um, essentially like a, like a soy sauce, but made into a paste without the, um, the salt. Um, and uh, buttermilk, I'm sure we all know what that is. But those are your probiotics and probiotic rich foods. Um, you can also take probiotics, but um, again, just look at the cultures there, see the diversity that they might have. Um, most of them are going to be the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. But if you eat prebiotic-rich foods, you can essentially feed the gut bacteria. So um, I, I encourage you to go for those prebiotic-rich foods. If you're feeding those good bacteria, they're going to thrive. So you don't have to eat the probiotic-rich foods all the time as long as you're eating those prebiotic-rich foods. So things like your vegetables, your fruits, your whole grains, onions, leeks, and garlic are, are specifically high in prebiotics. Um, legumes are also high in prebiotics. So think of those fiber-rich foods. That's what you want to go for. So this is an interesting diagram here that I made. So. If you see over on the right, you can see um, a, a picture with a bunch of different colors, a bunch of different shapes. Those are all symbolizing the different bacteria that are living in your gut when you have a healthy gut. So when you have a healthy gut, you, like, you have this big party of different bacteria, all different shapes and sizes, and doing all different kinds of things in our gut, and they're thriving. However, if you do get sick and you have a prevalence of bad bacteria in your gut and you need to go on antibiotics or even not even in your gut, you might have um, bad bacteria growing anywhere in your body that you need to take antibiotics for. So you, have, you take the antibiotics, that's not only going to wipe out the bad bacteria that they're aiming to wipe out, but they're also going to uh, wipe out a bunch of beneficial bacteria as well. So you're going to have a party that is cleared out. Um, you're going to have a lot less bacteria there in your gut if you're on antibiotics or have recently stopped taking antibiotics. So oftentimes people will reach for the probiotic at this point, but like I was saying, the probiotics that we can buy from on the shelf are usually bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. And we saw that big list of other beneficial gut bacteria. So when you're taking those two big supplements, you have an overabundance of these two beneficial gut bacteria in your gut, and it's actually going to slow down the recovery, slow down the rejuvenation of that big party because these, these um, primary beneficial gut bacteria are going to be eating most of that prebiotic, that, that good food. So it's actually going to be a slower recovery response than if you were to avoid the probiotic supplement and just start to eat a healthy diet full of those prebiotic foods, you would have a quicker recovery without that. So um, it can actually slow down the recovery. However, if your gut bacteria is not rejuvenating, if you're still having gut issues after you take antibiotics um, and you, you haven't been taking antibiotics for maybe a few weeks now and your gut bacteria is still unbalanced, you're still having GI issues, maybe it's time to take a probiotic at that point. There are some people who have to be on a probiotic for their whole life, so um, just something to think about there. If you can avoid taking the probiotic to start with and you can just have that spontaneous recovery by eating a healthy diet full of those prebiotic-rich foods, that, that's the way you want to try to go. 
So, like I was saying, if you eat a probiotic and prebiotic rich diet, you do not necessarily need to take a supplement. And it's important to keep in mind that supplements are not a cure all, they are just an extra tool that we can use to try to get your digestive health in order. Um, and as I was saying, most bacteria, bacteria that you can get from the shelf, the probiotic supplements, are made of bifidobacterium or, and or lactobacillus. So um, just keep that in mind. It's not a diverse bacteria that you're getting there. It's usually those two strains. Um, and make sure you're always taking your supplements wisely. Make sure you ask and inform your doctor that you're taking a supplement, any supplement. And um, also pay attention to any symptoms that you might be having when you're taking the, the probiotics. If you are having any kind of bloating or GI distress when you're taking the, the probiotics and not when you're not, by all means, don't take it. Um, sometimes the, the supplement can end up, uh, the capsule can end up opening up in your small intestines instead of the large intestines where you really want it to drop off, and that can cause GI distress quite a bit too. So being aware of any symptoms that you might have when you are taking a probiotic. So if you do need to take a probiotic, make sure you're picking a good one. Like I said, make sure you check with your doctor, see if they have any kind of um, supplement suggestions. Make sure you're going for a good quality one. You can look for on the label live and active cultures. You can look for a fridge shelf stable one. So you do want to keep your um, probiotics in the fridge after you open them. Um, it does help to slow down the degradation of the probiotic. So you want to slow it down, put it in the refrigerator, that'll slow down the life, it'll slow down the metabolic rate of the bacteria, so they will actually last longer and stay alive more. Soil-based organisms, those are going to be a better one to go for if you can find that one. Personalization, you would have to find a functional medicine doctor um, or, or get your gut bacteria tested specifically if you wanted to have that personalization, but that's just something to try to maybe keep in mind. Um, the, um, the units of your bacteria, you want to have more units, more CFUs, more strains are the better. Um, so if you can get one that's going to be more than just the bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, you want to go for a variety of strains. And like I was saying, always be mindful and watch for symptoms anytime you take any kind of medications or, or over-the-counter um, supplements. So um, we also looked at the, the dietary impact on your microbiome. So not just those macronutrients and, and um, polyphenols, but also looking at an overall diet. How does that impact your, your uh, microbiome? So a Western diet in general has been linked to a promotion of harmful gut bacteria. What does a Western diet mean? That means that the most of how that a typical American would, would eat. And I'll show you a chart here in just a minute too. But um, the associated disease states here is uh, increased cardiovascular disease, increased inflammation, increased type 2 diabetes and obesity rates. Um, so, so that's what that harmful gut bacteria has been linked to. Mediterranean diet, on the other hand, has been linked to a promotion of beneficial gut bacteria and prevention against cardiovascular disease, inflammation, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. So that Mediterranean diet is the way that you would want to likely go. Um, and like I was saying, that Western diet, higher in animal protein and fat, lower in fiber, whereas a Mediterranean diet is actually going to be higher in fiber, um, higher in antioxidants and those polyphenols. Um, you're going to get rich um, mono and polyunsaturated fats, those healthy fats here. Um, and I'll show you a chart right here. So what is a Mediterranean diet? So you're looking at the, the different pyramids here. The one on the left is going to be symbolic of a Mediterranean diet. The one on the right, the upside down pyramid, is going to be more like a Western diet. So we're basically flipping them on their heads. They're pretty much the opposite diets. So your, your Western diet, you have an excess amount or large portion of your diet coming from um, those processed proteins, those animal proteins, those pre-prepared foods, sweets and pastries, a smaller amount of your um, dairy products, especially the low-fat dairy products, some eggs in there, you've got some fish in there as well, a uh, smaller amount of your whole grains, rice, um, Whole, whole wheat bread or whole, whole, any kind of whole grain bread, um, beans and legumes, and then an even lesser amount of fresh fruit and uh, vegetables. Whereas a Mediterranean diet is going to be a large abundance coming from those fresh fruits and vegetables, um, a smaller amount, but still a good amount of your, um, your whole grains, your beans, your legumes, your rice, 
a smaller amount of your eggs, fish, low-fat dairy products, and um, very seldom doing the sweets and pastries. Those meats are coming in small amounts, and um, those pre-prepared foods, those processed foods are even less. So an overall Mediterranean-style diet is going to be looking at quality over quantity of foods. So we're focusing on the quality of our foods. We want to focus on whole foods. They're going to be naturally slower digesting. They're going to be naturally higher in fiber. Um, it's going to be a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables in a variety of colors. We like to say eat the rainbow. Try not to leave out any color there. Try to eat all the different colors. Minimally processed grains. Um, they can be whole wheat bread. It can be brown white rice, oats, bulgur, barley, uh, cornmeal. There are so many different kinds of whole grains. It doesn't need to be wheat, it, there's so many different types that you can result to. Um, proteins are largely going to be coming from seafood, beans, peas, nuts, seeds, lentils, um, and a smaller amount coming from our other protein sources like our lean red meat, poultry, eggs, fat-free and low-fat milk and yogurt and cheeses, so lower in saturated fats there. Also going to be making sure we're getting enough of those healthy fats in, um, those mono and polyunsaturated fats, olive oil, avocado. Um, again, your nuts and seeds are going to be in that group as well. And you want to avoid foods and be beverages that are going to have added sugar, sodium saturated fats, and trans fats. Um, so, so that's essentially what the Mediterranean diet it is looking like. So you want to focus more on that one. It's going to promote your healthy gut bacteria. So once you do establish this healthy gut, you want to maintain it. So to maintain it, you want to make sure you're following a diet that's full of nutrients, full of whole foods, um, naturally higher in fiber and, and naturally nutrient-rich whole foods. Um, we like to say diversity on the plate equals diversity in your gut. So going for a diversity, like I said, eat the rainbow. Making sure you're getting that physical activity in, so 150 minutes of getting your heart rate up every week, uh, plus at least two days of some kind of resistance or strength exercises. Getting that six to nine hours of sleep every single night, seven to nine hours of sleep every night is the typical recommendation. Uh, making sure you're getting plenty of fiber, so um, the typical recommendation for a day of fiber is 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. Um, so, so that would depend on, you know, your size, if you're a male or if you're a female, and of course what you're eating now. So if you're going from eating 5 grams of fiber a day to 25 grams of fiber a day, you're going to have a whole lot of GI distress from that. So you want to increase your fiber intake slowly. So you don't want to completely overhaul your diet overnight, but making little adjustments, not only will it be more friendly to your gut, you won't have a bunch of GI symptoms from that big change, but also it's going to be more sustainable for you. You're going to have those little modifications and you're going to be able to keep it up. So, um, so 25 to 35 grams is the standard recommendation for fiber um, in the U.S. Um, so this, this slide is really showing that, that overview, so your dietary intake, your food intake does impact your gut bacteria, and that does have biological effects on your body when it comes to infl inflammation, your immune system, and, and that can impact your overall disease states as well. It can inhibit or, or um, promote cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, um, autoimmune disorders, mood disorders, metabolic syndrome, a whole host of diseases. Disease state. So um, what you're eating is really making a difference on your gut, and your gut is really impacting your health. So that's what, that's what the overall conclusion is. Um, so focus on that gut microbial richness and diversity. Um, try to get that diversity on your plate so you can have that diversity in your gut. So some references um, based on what we went over today. Um, and of course, we're not taking questions in person today, but feel free to leave some comments if you do want to um, ask anything, or my email address is at the beginning of the presentation here if you want to jump back to that and email me any questions that you might have. Um, but thank you all for listening. Stay safe.